something that I'm... Well, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to the latest of our lockdown lectures. Welcome to those who are new to us and uh, welcome back to those who've been following our series. My name is Lynn Julius and I represent Harif, uh, which is the UK Association of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. We are five volunteers and we aim to raise uh, awareness of the history and culture of these Jews. Check out our website, www.harif.org, and our associated blog, Point of No Return blog. This evening, as, as usual, we will be recording uh, this session. Um, feel free to type in your questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. This evening, it's me uh, on the Arabs and the Holocaust. Um, the question I want to ask tonight is, what impact did World War II have on Jewish communities in the Arab world? And to what extent was the Arab world influenced by the Nazis? And is the legacy of Nazism still with us today? Now, a few years ago, we, Lawrence and I went to Berlin. We were at the Holocaust Memorial. And on the plaque, it says, um, Memorial to the murdered Holocaust, uh, to the murdered victims of the Holocaust in Europe. So, it is a common misconception that the Holocaust only affected Jews in Europe, uh, but of course that's not true at all. Uh, we do know that Sephardi Jews were very much, were also exterminated as well as Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, the communities of Salonika were almost wiped out and and, and communities in the Balkans. Uh, but the Jews in North Africa and the Middle East were affected as well. Um, so this is the villa at Wannsee, uh, just south of Berlin, uh, where the Nazi top brass uh, met in January 1942 to agree on the final solution. They went through each Jewish community in the world and uh, put a figure on the number of Jews who had to be exterminated. Now the figure for France was given as 700,000, which was odd because there were no more than about 400,000 Jews in France. So we, we must conclude that this figure included the Jewish communities of North Africa in the French protectorates of Tunisia and Morocco and in Algeria, which was actually considered and scholars have since confirmed that the Nazis did have a plan to exterminate the Jews wherever they found them. But their aim was thwarted by the Battle of El Alamein in late 1942, when the German General Rommel was defeated uh, by the Allies. And of the Battle of El Alamein, Churchill said, now, this is not the end, it is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. So, how did the Holocaust affect uh, these Jews? I think some two, four to five thousand Jews actually died. Uh, as a result of uh, either deportations 
or bombing um, or were, were just murdered. Um, this is obviously a drop in the ocean compared uh, to the six million Jews who died on the continent of Europe. We cannot compare. But I think it is fair to say that had the Germans not been defeated at the Battle of El Alamein, um, the Jews in North Africa and the Middle East would have been exterminated as surely as uh, the Jews in Europe. So let's have a look at the map of North Africa. You can just about see Morocco there on the west, Algeria in the middle, and then Tunisia, and then over in the east, uh, Libya. Morocco and Tunisia were French protectorates, Algeria was part of metropolitan France, and Libya was under Italian rule. In May 1940, the Germans invaded France, and the Vichy regime was installed in North Africa, in the North African protectorates and in Algeria. The Vichy regime were a pro-Nazi uh, government but run by French. Uh, they set up a special department for the control of the Jewish problem. Soon they imposed special rules and restrictions on the Jews. Uh, they, they were called the Statut des Juifs. And these laws were passed by the Vichy governments in these countries and were often more stringent than anything that the Nazis had implemented. In Algeria, which as I said is considered, was considered part of France, the Jews had actually enjoyed French uh, nationality uh, under the Decret Crémieux, uh, which was passed in 1870. Uh, the Decret Crémieux was abrogated and uh, the Jews were stripped of their French nationality. Quotas were imposed in schools. Uh, Jews were sacked from public service. Uh, from trade, banking, the media, medicine, law, um, their assets were put in trust. And that's really the first stage on the way to confiscation. To their credit, the mosques told their congregations not to take advantage of their fellow Algerians. So that was the situation in Algeria. In Morocco, In Morocco, uh, the Statut des Juifs were also imposed, but not as strictly. Uh, this is the future king, Mohammed uh, V of Morocco. And uh, there is quite a legend um, that has grown up about, uh, about the king of Morocco. Uh, not only did he wear the yellow star, it is said, but he asked for 20 more for his family. And of course, he was very philo-Semitic and he was reputed to have said, there are no Jews in Morocco, only Moroccans. Uh, but we do know and, and scholars seem to have uh, confirmed, uh, certainly people like Michel Abidbol and Georges Ben Soussan, have confirmed that he may have prevaricated over every uh, restrictive and discriminatory law, but he ended up signing every one of them. Uh, but there was a difference between Morocco and Algeria. Jewish converts to Islam were actually excluded. They didn't have to uh, comply with the restrictions. And Morocco was, uh, was, was sort of, 
unrestricted enough for there to be a sort of rat line uh, allowing refugees uh, to pass through um, Morocco on their way to the US. And uh, anyone who's seen the film Casablanca will remember, uh, you know, Rick's Bar, where all these refugees and expatriates would congregate. Uh, there was a, a Jewish lady called Hélène Cazès Benatar, who actually helped um, these refugees make it across Morocco and across the Atlantic into uh, America. Uh, but one thing that happened in uh, Morocco was the Jews were forced back into the ghettos from the, the European uh, sections of the towns, the Nouvelle Ville. And these ghettos were overcrowded and insanitary and full of disease. There were also quotas on schools and jobs and Jews were not allowed into public spaces like parks and cinemas. One thing that was, is not well known is that there were actual labor camps on the border between Morocco and Algeria and the inmates were there to build the Trans-Sahara Railway. Um, there were about 30 of them, I believe, and one was actually full of Jews, the Ghent, the one in the north, um, especially Jews of British nationality, that's Moroccan Jews of British nationality. We know of some who were interned there, uh, but basically, the prisoners were uh, defeated French soldiers from the French army or Spanish political prisoners, a kind of motley collection of, of foreigners, really. And here you see some pictures of the time. The, the labor camps were actually in the middle of the desert. There was no fencing around them because anyone who wandered out of these labor camps would actually die in the heat of the desert anyway. So there was no need to fence them in. Some of these pr prisoners were very badly treated. Uh, there was a particularly nasty uh, method of torture called the tombeau, where um, prisoners would lie in an open, uh, like an open grave, and be left there in the heat of the sun and, and in the uh, cold of the night um, and would be left without food and water. And obviously dozens must have died in those camps, although it wasn't, it wasn't like a concentration camp. So things began to change in November 1942, Asian, following the Battle of El Alamein. And uh, what was amazing is that the Americans started invading uh, Algiers, the port of Algiers, on the night of the 8th of uh, November. And they were helped in this by resistance fighters in Algiers itself. Uh, there were 377 resistance fighters, resistance fighters, and astonishingly, 315 of those were Jews. Um, it was an amazing feat because these Jews actually had very little training. They had no uniforms. Most of them were not armed. And yet they managed to take control of all the strategic, um, the main strategic, um, uh, points in Algiers, for instance, the governor's uh, palace, the police headquarters. Yeah, yeah, and they even they even bluffed. Uh, you know, they pretended to be the French admiral. Uh, they bluffed their way through, and uh, they they paved the way for the Americans to walk into Algiers. There's a very good film called The Night of Fools, which Harif showed a few years ago about this. Uh, but even though this was the beginning of the liberation, the Americans actually delayed restoring Jewish rights 
for about a year. It was not until October 1943 that Algerian Jews had their French citizenship restored to them. Uh, but immediately after this, the Nazis entered Tunis. Um, and you might think that was a bit strange because the Allies were already beginning to liberate North Africa. But the Nazis decided to occupy Tunisia Africa and to drive a wedge between the Allied advance coming in from Morocco on the one hand and uh, Egypt on the other. Um, up until then, the Vichy rules were not so rigorously applied, uh, thankfully, because uh, the Bay of, T of Tunisia was actually quite sympathetic to the Jews. And also the French uh, resident general was a practicing Christian. His name was Admiral Esteva, and he delayed uh, implementing the rules, or he didn't apply them very well. But after the uh, German occupation of Tunis, listening, the sound is not good. Um, I'm sorry about the sound, it's, it's to do with the signal. I think if you switch off your cameras, it might be better because it would use less bandwidth, those of you who've, who've got the cameras on. Um, so after November 1942 and the Germans enter Tunis, uh, things got very bad for the Jews. The, the commander in chief of the German occupying forces was a man called Walter Ralph, and he was, uh, he had invented the mobile gas van and was responsible for killing about 100,000 Jews in Eastern Europe. And he uh, headed uh, an SS death squad called the Egyptian uh, Einsatzgruppen. And their aim was really to exterminate uh, Jews in the Middle East and in Egypt. Uh, but because the Germans were actually on the back foot and were under pressure from the Allies, um, the Germans did not uh, actually have a chance to implement uh, their anti-Jewish policy beyond setting up um, forced labor camps. Tunisian Jews had their property seized and uh, about 5,000 of them were marched off to labor camps during the six months that the Germans were in direct control of Tunisia. Uh, radios were confiscated and the great synagogue uh, looked like a department store full of uh, radios. Um, the, the Italian Jews living in Tunisia were actually spared all this. Their property was not confiscated. Um, there was a Judenrat or Jewish council that recruited the Jews into the labor camps. Um, dozens died at the hands of sadistic uh, German officers, uh, but most of these Jews did survive. The Yellow Star was imposed on Jews in Sfax, we now know, but I don't think it was um, imposed in other cities in Tunisia. So throughout the spring of 1940, oh, in Sousa as well, thank you, Veronique. So through, throughout the spring of 1943, the Allies continued their advance. Uh, Ralph described the mood in his diary. The Jews were hopeful, the Arabs depressed. A man called Robert Satloff, an American, wrote a book examining the long reach of the Holocaust into Arab lands. And he describes the mood of the Arabs in this way. He says, as Jews went to labor camps in Tunisia, gestures of support and active assistance for the minority being displaced, disenfranchised, plundered and conscripted into forced labor were very rare. 
Arab passers-by would publicly insult and physically attack individuals. And this was actually corroborated by Albert Memmi in his writings. Uh, he said that the general population was, was pretty hostile to the Jews. Now, Robert Satloff um, spent three years in North Africa looking for Arabs who rescued Jews. He found stories of persecution, and he found stories of rescue. And this is his book here. It's called Among the Righteous. Most Arabs though, he said, were indifferent as in Europe. Uh, not many Jews had wanted to find Arabs who were righteous and not many Arabs had wanted to be found. Um, in fact, Satlov, found only four candidates. Uh, one was the King of Morocco, another was the Bay of Tunis, um, and then there were two others. One was called Khalid Abdul Wahad, and uh, the last one was not even in uh, Tunisia at all, and that was the rector of the Paris Mosque, C. Kadour Ben Gabrit. Now, Khalid Abdul Wahad, his story is very interesting because he was put forward to Yad Vashem uh, as a candidate to be righteous Gentile because he had saved Jews from um, German officers who had designs on, uh, on the Jewish women in, in, a, in the book, um, in the uh, book, Bougris family, I think it was. Um, and what happened was he hid the, these Jews in his farmhouse near Tunis. Uh, but Yad Vashem actually refused to recognize Khalid Abdul Wahab as a righteous Gentile. They said he didn't uh, risk his life, which of course is one of the criteria for being recognized as a righteous Gentile. And they also said that it was quite well known uh, that he was hiding Jews, but nevertheless, his heroism ought to be uh, recognized. Um, right, we'll, we'll discuss this a bit later, I think. Um, so let's go to Libya, where there were 33,000 Jews under Italian fascist rule. And the, um, the um, fascist regime had uh, passed racial laws in 1938. Uh, these were not always um, applied or, or sort of uniformly applied. But in uh, 1942, things began to get uh, very difficult. Um, a, a, a work camp was set up at Giado, which is south of Tripoli, uh, a terrible camp. Um, 600 Libyan Jews died of disease and starvation out of 2,000, um, and 870 Jews of British nationality were actually deported from Libya to Bergen-Belsen. Jews of French nationality were sent back to Tunisia and quite a few of them died in Allied bombing uh, in La Massa and other places. Um, oh yeah, okay, so this picture shows you uh, Libyan Jews actually returning from Bergen-Belsen where most of them survived or had been exchanged uh, as pr for prisoners of war. Uh, they are returning in a railway carriage and if you look ca carefully you might see a Union Jack on, uh, scrawled in chalk on the out outside of the railway carriage and it says to Tripoli and the reason why there's a Union Jack is because uh, these Jews were uh, British citizens. So we move on, 
says we are not seeing the picture. Can you see the picture now? I hope you can. Right, we move on. This is Egypt, where there were about 80 to 100,000 Jews. Um, the front line, if you remember, between the Allies and Rommel, Oh, thank you for that. Yes, the picture's visible. Um, the front line was shifting back and forth as the Allies, uh, as the Allies fought the Germans and the Germans fought the Allies. Uh, and El Alamein was the culmination of this. And of course, Egypt, you know, cities in Egypt were very close to the front line, for instance, Alexandria. And the Jews of Alexandria were terrified in case the Germans uh, conquered Egypt. And so they fled to Cairo and the Jews of Cairo fled to old Cairo or Fostat. Um, the king of Egypt who had succeeded uh, his father, King Fuad, this was the new king, King Farouk. He was a pro-Nazi. And he actually wrote a secret letter to Adolf Hitler saying that 90% of the Egyptian people supported the Nazis and, uh, you know, that he would be very happy uh, if, if the Germans won. There was a blacklist of Jewish businessmen and, um, you know, some of them did flee uh, uh, they did leave Egypt at the time. Uh, but of course, Alamein, El Alamein was the turning point, as I've already mentioned. So let's move on to the Middle East itself. In the Middle East, there was a strong current of pro Nazism and anti Semitism. And there were ultra nationalist parties that emerged at this time. For instance, the Syrian, uh, the Syrian, sorry, this is a bit confusing because the, um, the, the actual symbol you see there, which is of the Syrian Socialist National Party, uh, that's, that is the one based on the swastika. And the quote you see at the top of the page comes from uh, Samir al-Jundi of the Syrian Ba'ath Party. But basically they had a very similar philosophy. And Samir al-Jundi says, we were racists, we admired the Nazis. Anyone who lived in Damascus at the time was witness to the Arab inclination towards Nazism. And these parties were blood and soil uh, nationalist parties. They wanted independence for Arab states, but it was an independence that was are going to exclude anyone who was not Muslim and not Arab. Um, demonstrators in Aleppo chanted, uh, no more monsieur, no more mister, in heaven Allah, on earth Hitler. And there were nicknames for Hitler, for instance, he was Hajj Hitler or Muallam Hitler. And the Nazis were actually emulated across the Arab world. Uh, there were paramilitary youth groups set up like the Futuwa in, in Iraq and Young Egypt. Um, Abdul Nasser, Gamal Abdul Nasser, who was, going, who was the future president of Egypt, was actually a green shirt. Uh, with Young Egypt. And these groups held torchlight processions, just like the Nazis in Nuremberg. And they did the Nazi salute and, and they had, and they wore uniforms. So why did the Arabs support the Nazis in such numbers? It was a practical anti-colonial alliance against the British and the French. And um, it wasn't long before the Jews were seen as collaborators. Uh, with the colonialists. Um, in 1941, people generally believed that the Nazis would win the war. Arabs in Jerusalem began to stake their claims on Jewish property. Uh, this is for Ahmed and this is for Mohammed and um, this sort of thing. In May 1941, there was a massacre of eight Jews in Gabis in Tunisia. 
uh, what was the mood amongst Palestinian Arabs? Uh, the German consul in Jerusalem, Walter Dole, wrote, Palestinian Arabs in all social strata have great sympathies for the new Germany and the Führer. If a person identified himself as a German when faced with threats from an Arab crowd, this alone generally allowed him to pass freely. But when some identified themselves by making the Heil Hitler salute, in most cases, the Arabs' attitude became expressions of open enthusiasm. Enthusiasm for our Führer and the news, German, and the news German is probably so widespread because the Palestinian Arabs in their struggle for existence long for an Arab Führer. There was also rising nationalist violence in North Africa, uh, as well as in the Middle East. In Iraq, uh, a virulent form of nationalism emerged. Uh, the Syrian nationalist uh, Sati al-Husri entered Iraq with King Faisal in the 1920s. And extremist nationalists um, were anti-Semitic, and dominated the Ministry of Education in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, in the 1930s, uh, there was a great deal of sympathy for the Nazis. Um, and three to 400 Palestinian and Syrian teachers came into Iraq. They established the Muthana Club which was later to play a part in inciting the Farhud massacre of June 1941, of which more later. The nearest thing to an Arab Führer was, of course, the Palestinian Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajamin al Husseini. As soon as Hitler became leader in Germany, he made overtures to set up an Arab-Nazi alliance. The Germans were at first reluctant because the Arabs were technically untermenschen. Yes, they were Semites. Uh, they were not considered Aryans at first, uh, but this obstacle was soon removed and the passages in Mein Kampf uh, denigrating uh, the Arabs uh, were soon removed. And uh, the, the Germans soon realized that uh, it was actually not a bad idea to uh, make an alliance with the Arabs. It could be uh, very useful. Anyway, so they soon became considered honorary Aryans. Now, the Mufti is really the person who introduced ideological hatred of the Jews into Islam. He said Jews wanted to dominate not only in Palestine, uh, but across the Arab world. And the Jews became the epitome of evil. And later on in his uh, radio broadcasts, he, he, put, he conveyed the message, kill the Jews wherever you find them. This pleases God, history, and religion. And wherever he went in the Arab world, he, in, he incited hatred against the local Jews. So he wasn't just an anti-Zionist, you know, confining his hatred to the Jews in Palestine. He was a, an anti-Semite um, who hated the local Jews wherever he found them. Uh, now, there was a three-way alliance between uh, the uh, Palestinian Mufti, who you see in the center there of your picture, uh, and also the Muslim Brotherhood and the Germans. Now, the Germans soon realized that it would be useful to have, to incite an uprising in the Arab world against the British and the French colonials. Um, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was founded in 1928 by Hassan al-Banna in Egypt. Um, now, the Germans financed the activities of both the Muslim Brotherhood 
and the Mufti of Jerusalem. The Muslim Brotherhood um, was a revolutionary movement that wanted to reestablish the caliphate that had uh, come to an end with the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And they basically wanted to restore Sharia law uh, to uh, Arab countries. Um, their popularity grew quite dramatically through the 1930s and into the 1940s. They also believed in violence as a means to an end. Um, the Germans financed the arming of the Muslim Brotherhood, and in 1945, they had a million men under arms. And throughout this period, there was more and more propaganda circulated. Uh, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion uh, was, was circulated, and Mein Kampf was uh, translated into German and was actually serialized in uh, Iraqi newspapers in the 1930s. Now, between 1939 and 1941, um, the Mufti was exiled to Baghdad uh, by the British. And there he never ceased to try to plot the overthrow of the pro-British government. Finally, he and a, a group of pro-Nazi politicians read by, uh, led by Rashid Ali al-Ghalani and a group of pro-Nazi army officers succeeded in overthrowing the pro-British government. The pro-Nazi government barely lasted two months, uh, April and May uh, 1941. Uh, but it was actually the only Arab government to sign a military pact uh, with the Axis powers. And uh, declared, they declared war against Britain. Britain sent in uh, forces to try and defeat them. They finally managed to defeat the pro-Nazis. Um, and the, the leaders of the pro-Nazi government were put to flight. The Mufti fled at the end of May 1941 and ended up in Berlin. Uh, he was not the only one uh, to end up in Berlin, where he was a guest of the uh, Nazi uh, regime. There were 60 Arabs who were guests of, the, um, of Hitler lavishly funded, encouraged to uh, broadcast propaganda uh, and be a part of the whole Nazi enterprise. Uh, people like Rashid Ali, Fauzi al kawukji Abu Ibrahim al-Kabir, Hassan Salama, Arif Abdal Rafiq, Rasim Khalidi and Wasaf Kamal. Uh, during April and May 1941, when the pro-Nazi government was in power, there was fierce incitement against the Jews. And there were anti-propaganda broad, uh, anti-Jewish propaganda broadcasts from the German transmitter at Ziesen. These were shortwave propaganda broadcasts aimed at the whole Arab world. Uh, but before, the Mufti did flee uh, Baghdad. He laid the groundwork for the big massacre we know as the Farhud. The Farhud is an Arabic term meaning forced dispossession. And it took place over two days in June 1941. We do not know how many Jews were killed. Uh, the official figure is 179, but there could have been up to 600 Jews uh, killed. No one will ever know. 900 homes were destroyed, 1,000 Jews were wounded. There were terrible cases of rape and an awful lot of looting. The Jewish community had never seen anything like it. So the question is, was the Farhood a Holocaust event? And uh, Richard Sassoon asked this question. Um, and actually this was the subject of a, a legal case 
which was heard in the Israeli courts um, until recently. Um, lawyers representing survivors of the Farhud uh, took their case to court. They wanted the Holocaust recognized as a, um, as a Holocaust event so that the survivors were eligible for reparations. But the judges decided that uh, it, was, it was not a Holocaust event. It was just another bout of savagery that occurred from time to time, um, <clears throat> you know, in the Arab world. Uh, now, what's interesting is, can you just show the previous, previous one? Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah, that's right. Now, what is interesting is during the period that Iraq was under, uh, under the pro-Nazi government in April, May 1941, um, they actually set up a ghetto in uh, a city called Diwaniya. And this gentleman here, his name is Daniel Sasson, he gave an interview quite recently. He was five years old and his family were put in this ghetto. The ghetto was surrounded by guards and the men were made to do forced labor during the day. So this, I believe, is, is, is probably the beginnings of the process of rounding up uh, the Jews in Iraq and possibly sending them to extermination camps or concentration camps at any rate. But of course, um, they didn't get very far. Uh, because the pro-Nazi government was so short-lived. Uh, but it shows that there was an intention there, uh, I believe, to, uh, to perhaps... Um, yeah, Diwaniya is actually a, a town uh, on the Tigris, I believe, um, sort of a few hours south of, um, of Baghdad. Right, so, um, yeah. In 1941, this is the picture of the famous meeting between uh, the Mufti and Hitler. And the purpose of that meeting was for the Mufti to ask permission uh, to manage the mass extermination of the Jews, not just in Palestine, but across the Arab world. Uh, now, the Mufti was no stranger to genocide, having been an officer in the Ottoman army. And many of the Germans that um, people like him worked with went on to be involved in uh, the extermination of the Jews. Um, it, the Ottoman army was obviously heavily involved in, uh, in killing Armenians during the First World War. And the Mufti would have been very much aware of what was going on. It is often said that the Mufti's alliance with the Nazis was a pragmatic one, uh, but I would argue that it was actually an ideological one, uh, that the Mufti would not have stopped short of exterminating the Jews once the allied allies had been defeated, had the allies not, uh, not beaten the Nazis at the Battle of El Alamein. Yeah. These are some of his other activities while he was in Berlin. He set up uh, Muslim SS divisions in Bosnia and Albania. Um, and so we're going to just go back a bit, yeah. And here you see the um, Muslim troops at prayer. Right. Okay, so um, the Mufti was never tried as a war criminal in, uh, in Nuremberg after the war. And this, I think, means that the Arab world was, was never really denazified. Um, and in fact, after the end of the war, there began a period of intense anti-Semitism in the Arab world, uh, what Bernard Lewis calls the war against the Jews. Um, there was an Islamized anti-Semitism 
And anti-Semitism was actually at the core of the Muslim Brotherhood's philosophy. Uh, that the Jews were, no. Next, what's the next one? The principles. Yeah, so just to go into the, the philosophy of the Muslim Brotherhood for a minute. Um, Jews were at the very core of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood's philosophy. Um, and um, that's because they represented everything that the Muslim Brotherhood hated. For instance, modernity. You know, the Jews were the great modernizers. Uh, Jews represented women's rights. You know, like uh, Jews were uh, actresses and film stars and this sort of thing. They educated their women. Um, and the, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was, was against anyone really who disagreed with them. They were anti-dissident. And um, they were supremacist in, in that they would not brook any opposition. And they introduced this idea of, of terror in order to achieve their objectives. And as the writer Paul Berman puts it, tactics speak to a concern, but religious obligations speak to the eternal. So by making violence a religious obligation, they transformed it completely. Um, so this was something which really they introduced into Islam. And Jews were evil um, in, in contrast. They were, they were, Jews represented uh, not just evil, but power, you know, that they wanted to dominate the world. And this was actually an idea exported to the Arab world from Europe. And, uh, you know, it was a, a European idea and even a Nazi idea. And it contrasted with the traditional view of the Jew in Islam. According to the traditional view, the Jew had, had actually been defeated in the seventh century by Muhammad. The tribes had been, uh, you know, completely uh, conquered. The women sent into uh, uh, slavery and the men massacred. And after that, the Jews were really not considered very important at all. Um, and they were not a threat. So the European idea of the Jew introduced this idea of the Jew as all powerful. The Jew, uh, there was a conspiracy to dominate the world. And this was actually an innovation. It, um, you know, it entered the Arab world in the 20th century. Okay, so soon after the war in 1945 came the exodus of Jews from Arab countries. And this was just three years after uh, the end of uh, the war. People knew what had happened, um, you know, with uh, the, the extermination of six million Jews. And just three years later, um, the Arab League states passed uh, discriminatory laws that actually are reminiscent of the Nuremberg laws. They involve stripping Jews of their nationality, uh, restrictions on business and property ownership, uh, seized assets, boycotts, the freezing of bank accounts, exclusion from public service jobs, uh, they were not allowed to travel, and of course, Zionism became a crime. Um, I mean, how far the uh, Arab states were influenced by, was this anti-Zionism, was it anti-colonialism, or, um, or was it just a response to um, brainwashing by Nazi propaganda? Because don't forget, most uh, Arabs were illiterate, they were easily swayed and they listened to uh, propaganda on their radios. And I do believe that they must have been uh, inspired uh, by 
by the propaganda to hate Jews. And of course, um, there were riots against uh, Jews in Libya and in Egypt. In fact, in 1945, which is three years before Israel was established, Jews were massacred in uh, Libya. 130 Jews died there. There were riots in Egypt um, and elsewhere. We move on. So, as I mentioned, the 1950s was the era of the war against the Jews, an era of Islamized anti Semitism, um, and Nazi war criminals were given a ha haven in Arab countries. A large number of them came to uh, live in Syria, in, in Egypt. And they were responsible for continuing um, the campaign of, of uh, anti Semitism against the Jews, Nazi style anti Semitism. And one of them was Al Alois Brunner, who died in Syria. Uh, there were others. Um, and. Sure. Move. The next one. And in fact, Adolf Eichmann wrote in his memoirs, I have not managed to complete my task of total annihilation, but I hope the Muslims will complete it for me. Just goes to show uh, that the Arabs were considered the heirs to the Nazis in, in the sense uh, of, of being totally anti-Semitic. This is the flag of Islamic State, uh, which, as we all know, was, uh, was on the rampage in the north of Iraq and in Syria just recently, uh, in, um, in 2014. Uh, it has been defeated, but you can imagine that if Jews uh, were still living in northern Iraq and in Syria, uh, they would have been massacred as surely as um, the Yazidis uh, or the Assyrians and their women sent into slavery and that sort of thing. The flag of the Islamic State is its quotation from the Quran. And basically the Islamic State uh, wanted to forcibly convert or kill uh, all the infidels. Uh, now, the Islamic State, or Daesh, or ISIS, whatever you want to call it, uh, they were heavily influenced by the writings of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the um, Hassan al-Banna and a guy called uh, Said Qutub, um, their writings have helped mold the ideologies of uh, Al-Qaeda, of ISIS, and Hamas. And if you look at the Hamas Charter, you will see references to uh, the, 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 the Jews want to control the world. They started the French Revolution. They started uh, the Russian Revolution, and they were behind, um, and they were behind uh, World War I and World War II, uh, straight out of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Yes, this is the flag of Islamic State. It's got a Quranic inscription on it, the flag of Muhammad. Uh, but basically, the, the whole movement um, is, is very much influenced by the writings of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. People like bin Laden, al-Zawahiri, Khalid Sheikh Muhammad, who was behind the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks, were all... Uh, members of the Muslim Brotherhood. And of course, uh, the leader of Islamic State himself, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who, uh, who was killed, I think, a few, uh, a year or so ago, he was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. So I would say that there's a direct link uh, from the Muslim Brotherhood, which was inspired by yeah. European and Nazi ideas of, of anti-Semitism. There is a direct link between them 
and uh, Islamic State or Daesh. And of course, even though um, Islamic State has been defeated, uh, their, their ideas are still uh, very much alive. There are jihadis who return from Iraq at large in Europe today. Uh, the terrorism still continues. And although we're all very excited by um, you know, the new deal uh, that uh, has been reached between Israel and the UAE and moderate Arab states, we have to remember that um, uh, some of these Arab states are really very extreme. Uh, for instance, Kuwait said they would never sign a, a, a deal with Israel, and that's because they are very much influenced by the Muslim Brotherhood. Iran, another problem there, um, uh, you know, they're deep into Holocaust denial um, and uh, hostility to Israel. Qatar, another state that's very, very heavily influenced by uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. So I think I will leave it there. Thank you very much for listening. And I'd be very happy to take questions or right, to right. read out some of your comments. I'm going to interrupt now. I have unmuted Ariel and Sandy. And Ariel, do you want to go first and Sandy second? Um, and anyone else who wants to raise the questions, if they can put it in the chat and I will unmute you and put your video on. So Ariel, over to you. Yes, I just uh, want to add uh, a thing about uh, 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 Casablanca. In Casablanca, you have also uh, resistance also. I found in a text that uh, Dr. David Cohen writes that the uh, family Benazeraf was also active in Casablanca. I don't know uh, if my father was there, but uh, my mother who have a motorbike <laughs> because she cannot uh, drive more a uh, car. She was going to the camp uh, when the people was arriving. So she was taking the phone number to phone in Europe to say to the family, if there exist, yes, she don't, but she was phoning in, in Europe uh, to say that uh, their parents arrived in Casablanca. She have no problem, or I believe, as an accountant uh, bookkeeper, that the point was that she can phone into Berlin, Germany, because in her building, it was an uh, office of uh, German, uh, German people. She always said that when she go to work in uh, Boulevard de la Gare in her uh, building, uh, 2527, I found in postcard that uh, the people were there was going down when she was going up and she understand. So in the post office, I believe that if they will hear uh, German from my mother, she will not ask questions or she, they will close because in the building they are German. That's the uh, thing that I, uh, that I uh, approach, you know, make it together. But she was each day going there to see if uh, she can uh, help uh, these uh, people. And I found it, she tell me about 40 years ago that she don't know where are uh, their picture of the 8th November 1942, because in the 30s, I, begin, I believe that my mother, uh, from the 30s, my mother were, was going in all places with uh, an apparel de photo. Uh, mm. photo camera, yes. So I, I found uh, last week uh, the, the photo that she takes from uh, her office, in Boulevard uh, uh, de, de, de la Gare, a boat she, she write there, Le Jean Bar uh, Flambe, we can see smoke. And she says that this smoke came from the Jean Bar. And the, the boat who send shells to the Jean Bar was uh, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. This is the, the big cuirassé Massachusetts. And the uh, a lot, we have the chance that a lot of uh, the shells, if it is a term, that uh, uh, they send, part of them don't explode, 
one who don't explode uh, fall on the house of my great great father so he don't explode yeah. but the uh, the house was destroyed but my father stay on the first floor and uh, yeah. nothing happened nothing perhaps in his head yes it was a yeah. shock it yeah. was a shock cool. but uh, my my father don't died and the synagogue also like today they make uh, uh how you say a museum jewish museum in casablanca also it don't explode so it was uh, a miracle so this thing was uh, i was not yet born but uh, i see i, I see this uh, this uh, this thing and there is in I have a friend for sous if you want to contact him and he was eight or nine year old and uh, he spoke all the story of uh, the bombing of the, the army's alliés and that they have to flee and that in this part uh, the tunisian people uh, uh, help them that's what i have to, to say yes okay thank you very much uh, for sharing that now, sandy was the next question okay. she, you need to unmute yourself sandy Sandy, can you unmute yourself? Oh, um, yeah. Um, I right. forgot what my question was. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it had to do with what the Islamic flag said, because I don't read Arabic. Oh, okay. Yes. I don't speak it or read it. I, I know a few words, but not enough to help me with this. Yeah, uh, I think it was, um, was it? Um, is, well, we've got Arabic speakers here who can give you an exact translation. Get back, maybe, back. maybe I'll get the slide back on the screen. Maybe Emil can. Uh, <laughs> okay. Right. What does it say, Emil? Oh, there it is. Just one second. This is my next. One. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Emil, you're unmuted. No. Hello, Emil. He might have gone to make a, himself a cup of tea. Okay, well, um, it probably says... Um, yeah, I got it now. Yeah, I got it. It says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. No God except God. Muhammad is the messenger of God. Right. Thank that's, you for that's that. That's a standard... I know Hello. Danielle got it too. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you. We had Thank a question. You very much. I want to ask a question later on. Emil, you had a question? Um, I no. made a lot of comments. I'm not sure whether I had a question, but I made a lot of comments. I, I mean, one important comment, Lynn, is that please do not show that photo that says this is how the Farhood was. You know, that photo yeah. is a fake. Believe no, me. I know. You mean the one where they're brandishing the saber? Yes, that's a fake. Yeah, yeah. I never said location. that was actually from the Farhood. It was from the lead up to the Farhood. It was. It was a demonstration it's against. In the uh, wrong location. It's, yeah. I know the building. These all these Art Deco places, you know, that you show all these balconies and things like that. Yeah. It's nowhere near where it happened. Nowhere near that. Right. Okay. I mean the whole the whole thing. I mean, you know how it is. There are so many fake pictures nowadays. Yeah, it, it, that picture is used a lot to illustrate. I know it is. That's why I'm asking you. Not to I know, use it. I know, but, but I didn't actually say it was the the actual uh, scene from the Farhood. Yes, but it, <laughs> people think of it as such. Yeah. You know, okay. say, oh, this point is taken. Farhood. Point right. taken. Yeah. I, um, there's a question here asking for. Uh, books, could I suggest books to read on this topic, Farhood by Edwin Black, yes that's a very good book. Um, there is, a, uh, a, I just see what I've got here, an excellent uh, book by Shmuel Moray and uh, Tzvi Yehuda also on the Farhood. Um, there is a book on uh, Jihad and Jew Hatred by Matthias Kunzel which shows the uh, Nazi influence on uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. And there's the uh, members um, of Eden at the back. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah, well, Rather there's, if you, if you want an account of the Farhood uh, of the British, um, of, of the British um, 
war against uh, the pro-Nazi government, if you like. There's an account of that in uh, Memories of Eden, uh, and of course, personal memories of, of um, it's an Violet Shamash. Um, but also the complicity of the British and Cornwallis and what- Yeah, yeah, I know, that's, that's the, um, that, that's the, the British and how the British allowed the Farhood to happen. Actually, yeah. let me let me pop up. There's also if you go to the, the public records in Kew, uh, it's amazing that all the consular records around the time of the Farhood had been removed. They were destroyed. So the, all the key correspondence from the British Embassy um, in Baghdad to the Foreign Office doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, you can't see what was said. But that that actually relates to another talk which I gave about the British in Iraq, which shows that uh, they turned a blind eye to the violence, they didn't intervene even though the, uh, uh, the British army was outside the gates of Baghdad and could easily have entered the city and stopped the killing. Uh, I've got Marjorie who asked a question, is that your, yeah. muted. Marjorie, does no. that answer your question? Anything, any other points? Yes, yep. Uh, no, that's fine. Okay, yeah. next one is Daniel Abel. Daniel. Daniel. No, I just wanted to say what was on the... Uh, so you're very yeah, I can't hear you, yeah. Maybe put up your, your volume, the volume on your machine. Machine, machine, machine. We can't hear her. Okay, can you ask your question on the chat again then, and we'll read it out. Okay, are there any other questions? Silence. <laughs> well, I think we've got more answered. Yeah. Are there any more questions? Ah, why are Jewish officials, especially French ones, so reluctant to evoke that history? Interesting one from Veronique. Um, I think there is a resistance from. Um, <laughs> Jews who, who experienced the Holocaust in Europe and certainly Holocaust museums to, um, to evoke that history. I think it's been, you know, a, a, a real struggle for, uh, for the Farhood, for instance, to be recognized by the, uh, the US uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum and also Yad Vashem. Uh, there is a sort of tendency to downplay, um, you know, to, to sort of pretend that somehow um, Jews from Arab countries want to, I don't know, maybe, maybe they want to, to show that they too were victims of the Holocaust and, and, and the comparison is not appropriate. Uh, it could be that, you know, they feel that uh, the monopoly is, is being challenged in a way. Uh, and of course, I must emphasize that, that the, the Holocaust in Europe, you know, was, was of a magnitude, of such a magnitude, you can't conceive of, of, of uh, the suffering that, that was there. But it, it, there is no reason to ignore uh, the impact of the Holocaust in North Africa and the Middle East. And certainly, I do believe that uh, events like the, the Farhud in, um, in Iraq were uh, influenced by Nazi propaganda. They were influenced uh, by the broadcast. They were influenced by incitement from, from the Mufti. Uh, and they were influenced by this whole idea of uh, that the, the Jews wanted to dominate the world and have, have to be, uh, and they have to be fought at all costs, which was a very Nazi idea. Uh, so, you know, I think um, things have changed in the last few years. I think after lobbying by people like Edwin Black and Shmuel Moray, um, and, and I think this is obviously a good thing. It's, it's not a good thing when Israeli courts, you know, uh, turn down um, requests from Farhood survivors to, to receive compensation and 
when they say, you know, I, but I, I, I don't think we've got to the end of the road here. I think um, the, the case will be pursued until the survivors get what they want, uh, even if it means changing, uh, changing the law in the Knesset uh, to allow them to receive reparations. Is there anything else? Unmute everyone now. Everyone is now unmuted. Uh, there's a free for all. Yeah. Uh, if I can add another thing that was working in a hostel and in 1997 arrived there, uh, a tourist. And uh, when I asked him uh, from where he came, came from America, and it was a doctor, a Dr. Weiss. So I see his age and I asked him where you were in 1940, 45. He said, we arrived in 1942 in Algeria. He gave me also a picture that I found about uh, the arrival of the American. And after in September 44, they arrived in Marseille and they opened the synagogue in September and there was no, they cleaned the synagogue, there was no uh, doors because uh, the Germans take out the, the doors and they began in September 44 the uh, office of Rosh Hashanah in Kippur. Oh. And, uh, uh, in in uh, the, uh, the American chaplain, yes? And another thing is that Madame Eleanor Roosevelt know all about the, uh, the Shoah. But yes. her, her husband, the president of America, don't want to hear nothing about. And she go and manifest. The other thing is that it's possible that uh, the Dr. Weiss tell me that if they can take picture of Auschwitz for the American army or English army, but if one bomb fall there, they will make it in a, uh, in a court, in a military court. So people know exactly what they were there. They can go from Italy to, to, to Poland to, to bomb and to come back. But uh, be careful, the first to by error, we leave, uh, we leave a bomb or something like that. It was very, very hard. Yes, I mean, this whole question of why did the Allies not bomb Auschwitz? And they knew... Uh, Antisemitism. They uh, want also to clean. I am very sorry. We know that in America, if I can, sorry, if I can say slowly, the problem was with communism that the end with the communism, it will be 350 million people who will kill, though I don't know. Mm -hmm. So if we, the Nazi in England, or the Nazi in America, or the Nazi uh, in, uh, in, in France, can help Adolf Hitler to finish with, uh, with the communism, so 66, 66 million people, for this war is less than 350 million. Uh, I am not an historian, well, but I give you... Yeah, of course, there was a great fear of communism. There were all sorts yes, of reasons yes, yes. why Auschwitz was not bombed. But I, actually, it's an interesting question. Why, why did the Americans not restore Jewish rights in Algeria as soon as they'd uh, as soon as Operation Torture oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it took them a whole year. It and was a fight. Be... It was a fight Ben Giro. It was a fight with De Gaulle. It was a fight with Weygen and Leclerc and all these people. They don't want to put their uh, hand, but only after J Jews go to Gibraltar and London and they phone to America. So Jews in America fight to give the, their brother in Algeria back the, because the people who make this uh, 88 uh, November 42, they take them in prison. They want to judge them. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. It is true that some of the resistance fighters ended up yeah. in, interned. Yes, interned. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so, you know, they'd help the Americans uh, invade. <laughs> me, who? This was the reward that they got. <laughs> They ended up in, in jail. Isn't it? It's yeah. absurd, isn't it? Absurd. Yes. Lynn, tell me who, who loves Jews? <laughs> <laughs> we were in Egypt. They, they, we, are, we were the worst shepherds when our father were in Egypt. Why? 
because the other one uh, adore the sun and the, the moon and the stars and they prostrate to them. But these people, we don't know from where they came. Uh, I don't know if Joseph yeah. in the morning not take creme Nivea to be as uh, black as uh, uh, black as Egyptian, you know. And he used uh, the sun instead of uh, prostrate to him in the morning. Sorry, <laughs> we are special people. What can we do? Yeah. Yes, I see what you mean. Um, <laughs> you are is there anyone else who wants to make a comment or? Hello, hello. It's, it's Michael Crook here from Hove. Um, I did put a question in at the same time as uh, Lawrence was actually ask, answering part of it. Um, given the yeah, given, given the extensive American and Allied troops uh, across the whole of North Africa, um, surely they must have known what the, what the circumstances were of the Jews, um, but they don't seem to have done anything about it at all. Um, is that is that basically because they weren't interested, or because it was just too much for them to handle? Bearing in mind they were trying Maybe to beat the Germans at the same time. I, I think they made a mistake in keeping the Vichy officials in post. I think oh. as soon as they'd um, they'd invaded, they didn't bother to change the setup. You know, oh. so these anti-Semitic officials were still around. <laughs> right. Yeah, and the, and the Allies were too busy, uh, too busy trying to fight the Germans to worry about what the Vichy officials yeah. were doing. Yeah, probably yeah. the Jews okay. were sort of oh, looking down Lawrence. the list of priorities. And if, you, if you actually look at the time of the North African campaign, when you had the, the coup in Iraq and the Farhud, etc., that was the British were their low in North Africa and Rommel was winning the war. <laughs> and they spent the worst old, the kind of the last of the reserves and the, the poorest troops were sent to, to leave Baghdad. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, okay. it, it was Thanks. not their priority, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Thanks very much. Oh, I guess I'm on. Oh, I guess I'm on. I guess I'm on. I guess I'm on. We got the echo. I think you've got two things on. You've got the. Is that Daniel? Yeah. 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 What I wanted to mention. I can't oh hear you. Sorry, we can't hear you. Lynn, can you answer my question? <laughs> yes, sure. Yeah, what is, who's talking? That's Melvin, I think. <laughs> Melvin. <laughs> I, I actually wrote it in the chat. Um, <clears throat> you talked about um, uh, Hajam al-Husseini. Um, was he issued a blood certificate by Hitler to Aryanize him? Oh, I, I don't actually know. I, I don't know if he needed one. Um, well, that's the method that by he then, By then, all, all, um, all Arabs were considered honorary Aryans. Okay. So I, I don't think um, it was ever an issue. But he did use the um, blood certificates as a manner, as a matter, a manner of um, Aryanizing uh, Germans, certainly. Who, who weren't uh, there. Right, yeah. No, I think they just sort of took it as read that Arabs were were okay. <laughs> they were Aryan <laughs> enough, yeah. And and uh but it was an issue in um in in Paris. You know, I mentioned uh Ben Gabrit, who was the rector of the um Mosque. of the Paris mosque mm. and uh, Robert Satloff thought that he should be considered a righteous gen uh, gentile and what he did was he issued <coughs> um, certificates to Jews um, you know saying that they were actually uh, Muslims and and in this way saved uh, quite a few Jews in Paris but it now transpires actually that the the, the, the the story is much more complicated than that, and that he might even have denounced certain Jews. So he certainly does not deserve to be considered mm. a, a, a righteous Gentile. Uh, but a film was made uh, mm. about this guy, Ben Gabriel. Um, I've forgotten the name of it now. But actually, you know, um, uh, extolling him as a hero. Uh, but, you know, one has to be very careful with these people because, you know, like, uh, 
uh, things come out a bit later that shows, uh, you know, that show that the, the person was not quite as good as, <laughs> as people make out. Yeah. So, yes, there's a, a good film called A Matter of Time. Again, we have shown it uh, way back uh, in, way back in, in uh, I think, 10 years ago or so. A Matter of Time about the Holocaust in Libya and Tunisia. Um, I think it's the only film actually made about uh, the Holocaust in, uh, in North Africa. Mm. Uh, a matter of time and that, that makes the point obviously had uh, the, the Allies not uh, won the Battle of El Alamein it was only a matter of time before all the Jews would have been exterminated in North Africa uh, There were plans for concentration camps in the Dotan Valley in Palestine um, that we know of in Iraq, there, are, there were no plans that we know of, but an interesting hap thing happened just before uh, the pro-Nazi government fell, uh, and that was the self-styled governor of Baghdad, who was a pro-Nazi called El Sabawi. He uh, summoned the chief rabbi of Baghdad, uh, Sasson Khadouri, and he told him to tell the Jews to pack enough food for three days, lock themselves in their houses. And uh, did you hear me there? Uh, so, uh, you know, one wonders why would he tell the Jews to do this? And it sounds like he was preparing them to go on a journey, perhaps to a camp. Uh, and that could be, you know, and that, that might have been uh, uh, their plan to get rid of the Jews. We don't know. Uh, but, you know, thankfully, the um, pro-Nazi government fell a day later. Uh, so we, we will never know. But, of course, the Farhud was, uh, you know, was, was a direct result of incitement against uh, the Jews in Iraq. Ah, there's another man who saved people, right? Well, there are various people who saved, um, but very few Arabs have actually been recognized as righteous Gentiles. There's one Egyptian doctor in Berlin called Dr. Helmi, who was recognized as a righteous Gentile. Uh, but apart from that, all the others are Albanian, Albanians, I think, or Bosnians. There are no no Arabs. Do I have any history of the South African forces in North Africa, Merle? Uh, I'm afraid not. <laughs> uh, South African forces. I'm sure that they were part of the Allied forces. You'd really have to consult, um, you know, a book about their involvement in World War II. Uh, yes, Selina's grandmother saw the events of the Farhood. She died two years ago. Uh, was, was her story recorded? Because it would be a great shame if, if her story was not recorded. Because uh, survivors are getting very thin on the ground now. Um, um, yeah, I mean, my, my mother has a story uh, about the Farhood. Uh, you know, the, my family was actually saved on my father's side by a pro-Nazi neighbor, uh, but his, his wife was, was a lady and she welcomed the family into the, the, the house and she uh, gave them hospitality until the trouble had, had died down. Uh, and of course, the pro-Nazi, uh, <laughs> the pro-Nazi neighbor stopped the looters from taking all the furniture out of my grandparents' house, and he made them put everything back again. <laughs> so that was that that, that that was their story. Yeah, that, yeah, that's right. No. <laughs> 
anyway, I think we will wrap it up there. Um, thank you very much indeed for coming to listen to me. Um, we have a real treat next week, uh, a talk on the Cairo Geniza by the head of the um, department there in Cambridge, Ben Uthwaite. So we look forward to seeing you again next week. And thank you very much for, uh, for joining me. Oh, thank you. Uh, about South Africa, <laughs> I think someone's got some information. Uh, but just, um, I think let's leave it until next next week, perhaps. Right. Okay. The, Thank the, you. There, is there a recording available on Facebook now? There will also be a recording on the uh, Harif website. Lind will send a list of books on the Farhood as well, and she will put that on the Harif website. Um, okay. Well, okay. thank you very much indeed. Thank from you. Lauren and me. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Tadaraba. Merci, Doria. Bonne nuit. Merci. Bonne nuit déjà. Onze. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Bonne nuit. Dormez bien. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Laila Tov, Laila Tov from Jerusalem. Thank you, Jerusalem. <laughs> was, was there a, a Mr. Crook on this audience? There was someone, Mel Crook, on the, in the audience, yes. Uh, there was also a Mr. Crook, Michael Crook. Um, I don't know. Unfortunately, we are, we're not keeping a list of the participants. So. Uh, okay. This is Merle's husband, Graham Crook. Oh, right. Yes. Hello. Yes, Hello. you've got information you. on the, the South African. Yes. yes. My late father fought through North Africa into Egypt and eventually ended up liberating the camps in Europe. Wow. I, when he passed away, I found all the maps of the South African forces through North Africa, El Alamein, Libya, Egypt. He ended up um, liberating the camps and then with the end of the war, <laughs> met up with a whole bunch of Americans and they ended up in uh, what was then Palestine and he fought in 48 and 56 in, in the wars in Israel. Oh wow! How amazing! Do you still you've still got those maps though? Yeah, sure. I've, I've kept those maps. Gosh! And are there any books you could recommend about the South Africans? Yes, in, uh, I've, got, I've got a few North books. Africa? There's the South Africans at War, yes, um, where they describe the battles against Rommel. Yeah. And in fact, when I was in London. About three, four years ago, um, I was having a dinner with a cousin of mine who now lives in London. And after dinner, he said, uh, just hang on, I've got something for you. Yeah. He, went, he went down to his basement and he came out with a file of letters that my late father had written back to his family throughout the war. So yeah. I've, I've managed to track all his movements through these letters and the maps. Um, wow. he, Fascinating. he actually ended up through Italy. He saw, he saw um, Mussolini at the end, and I've, I've managed to sort of trace his entire movements. So I'm still researching them, and yes, I do have the maps, but I'm oh. thinking of donating them either to the War Museum in South Africa yeah. or somewhere in Israel. Right, not not the Imperial War Museum. Or... I think it's more relevant <laughs> in Israel. Yeah, in Israel. Yeah. Israel. I may give it to the uh, because there's a lot about his um, the 1948 war, so I may just give it to the Israelis. Yeah, that's fascinating. Gosh. But it's, it's a research project on its own. It is. No, thank you for that. That's thank great. You. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Uh, right. I think that on that note, I will end the meeting now. I've